Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm David Ibbett, and I'd like to welcome you to Exploring Exoplanets Through Music. There's violinist Amelia C. there. And I'm going to start by showing you a music video.
So uh, that was Water Romanza, and it's a piece about water uh, on distant worlds. And the music video uh, featured, um, you can see myself there, um, Beth Sterling, soprano, and Amelia C. Violinist. And it was created um, for a special streaming experience with the uh, uh, Science, uh, Science Museum of Boston. So um, their animators did an incredible job. Uh, here's the album art uh, for that piece. Uh, so now that I've, I've shown you some, some music, um, I just want to introduce myself a little more. So I'm David Ibbett. And I'm a composer with a passion for science. I'm guest composer at Fermilab, uh, which is a particle physics research at the heart of America. And I'm the director of Multiverse Concert Series. Uh, it's a nonprofit we run out of Massachusetts, and we, we create these concerts of music and science where musicians and scientists collaborate and uh, perform together and uh, discover the world together. Um, just show you the kinds of things that we like to do. Um, here is a project we did in the planetarium uh, in Boston, uh, Charles Hayden Planetarium. And you can see that the, the inspiration is these uh, fluid dynamics patterns and they are drawn from the work of Dr. Ermgard Bischofberger of the MIT Fluids Lab. So I don't know if you can see the, the, the image, uh, that's directly from her research and then the animators had a lot of fun turning it, colorizing it and turning it into, into video. And she's interested in mathematically modeling the behavior of fluids and the way that um, fluids will naturally form fractal patterns uh, as they disperse uh, with a certain amount of, of chaos. Uh, and these patterns are uh, at the heart of um, the way fluids behave, but they're also the way life behaves and grows. Our, our lungs, the branches of our lungs are formed in a, a similar way and riverbeds. So there's a lot for, for artists and composers to, to dig into uh, in so many aspects of science and this is the core of my work. Here's another project. We did um, a ballet called Cellular Dance about the uh, movements of cells, the concerted movements of cells, how they can move together despite not having um, a central nervous system yet in the embryo with Alexei Varaxa of UMass Boston. And we have a particle physics project about neutrinos with Fermilab. So that's just a, a few of the things. And you know, if I leave you with any message today, it's that uh, music and science and art uh, are kindred disciplines and they have so many cross connections and there's really so much to be done uh, by working with them together and, and sharing them with you all. Uh, we like to do live events, uh, I should say, um, with families as well as uh, sort of concert goers. And of course, we haven't been able to do that so much recently. You all know why. Um, so we've adapted for streaming and we're, I'm thrilled to be here presenting a project um, over a distance. I'm, uh, I'm in Burlington, Massachusetts, and it's, uh, it's a sort of an English day uh, overcast. That's where I'm originally from. Uh, so it suits me very well. Uh, but we do want to get out to do live events again. I'm sure you all do too. So today I'm talking about exoplanet music and the project is called Octave of Light. And there are the three of us, the live musicians. So um, it's a concept album, and you just heard the first piece, Water Romanza. And I, was, I worked for a long time to create it with Roy Gould of uh, Harvard Smithsonian Astrophysics. There he is, he's a wonderful man. And here's his book uh, that uh, greatly inspired me, Universe in Creation. Uh, and it has a lot of different um, observations about how our universe is finely tuned for life uh, down to the, the sort of basic chemistry that gives rise to cells and sort of organic processes and the fact that we live in an abundant universe of planets with plenty of them uh, with earth-like conditions for life as we know it or perhaps uh, something we can't imagine. So he does a lot of work on exoplanets and I thought I would just um, give you some exoplanet facts Let's see, perhaps you already know these. In fact, I'm gonna ask you some questions. So use the chat. Uh, I was born in 1985. 
Um, how many exoplanets had been discovered in 1985? Does anybody want to know or guess? 2,500? I can say that's off. 40? I've got quite a few correct answers. Yeah, it's um, zero. Uh, so uh, as far as we knew, um, planets beyond our solar system were science fiction at that point. You know, it seemed likely, but we, we didn't have any proof. Uh, the first exoplanet was discovered, well, if anyone's uh, very bright, perhaps you'll know, 1992. And that was discovered, uh, kind of an unusual method involving pulsars. Uh, but uh, how many exoplanets are known about today, planets beyond our solar system? In fact, I checked this a few days ago, so it's possible that my answer is off by a few, because, uh, uh, well, there's a hint. Anybody want to guess how many do we know about? Oh, we've got some very ambitious answers. We've got a few. Someone thinks a million. I, I, I'm sure there are a million. The answer, uh, as of, I think, two days ago, it was 4,379. So that's pretty good, right? I mean, uh, in my lifetime, we've seen these discoveries. And it's clear that we're living in the middle of an exoplanet revolution. For the first time, we know that the universe is full of planets. And it seems almost every star has a planet. And here's a nice image from NASA um, showing, um, in fact, this is, uh, this is old, this is 2019. So what's that? Over 300 discovered since this image was made. And you can see there are big clusters discovered all at once with uh, different methods. Uh, so you know, the estimates for how many there might be out there are just ginormous. So I'm a composer. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm passionate about science, but I'm not a trained scientist. So I want to celebrate science in my own way, uh, as I'm sure we all do. Um, so what can I do? Well, I have a tool at my disposal called sonification. And it just means representing data as sound. Um, human beings, we tend to prioritize visual when we're choosing a way to represent some numbers. We, we lean towards a graph or a chart. Um, but uh, because of that, um, we, we might not think of representing data through sound. And if we do that, sometimes it can show us new things about the information and reveal new relationships uh, between what's there. Because uh, we emphasize the visual, sound has this amazing ability to affect us subconsciously. I'm sure you've all had the experience where music has has reached you and moved you uh, in a way that you didn't expect uh, or weren't prepared for. It has this way to sneak in and uh, create emotion. Sonification is a tool. It's used in science uh, to help with research, and, but it can also be brought into musical composition and communicate emotionally. And that's what I enjoy doing. So Octave of Light, uh, there's a sort of a core concept for how the album works, and I want to share it with you. So here's a nice little movie from the European Space Agency. And this is showing, let's watch that again. This is showing how many exoplanets are discovered via the transit method. The problem with seeing exoplanets and the reason it took so long to discover them uh, is that they're, they're so small, uh, just ba barely a dot, uh, and they're, they're close to a star, which means that the light of the star uh, obscures them with a glare. Uh, so we have yet to sort of take a picture of an exoplanet directly. Instead, what you have to do is watch a star over time and the light of the star will dip as the planet goes across the surface. And you, if you time that well, you can figure out the, uh, the period of the planet's orbit. And you can also um, get one of these, uh, this is a spectrum. Uh, this is exactly what you get if you shine light into a prism or a rainbow. Uh, you take the, the light, or in this case it's the shadow, and you split it into colors. So every exoplanet has a unique color spread wide through the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is a fairly wide spectrum we're looking at. It's not the complete electromagnetic spectrum. 
Um, and there are some issues with this because um, you can see sort of this, this is um, sort of visible colors, uh, sort of blue to red. And you'll see that there's some interesting stuff there, but there's a lot more interesting stuff uh, beyond what our eye could see in the infrared. So um, the, the, the eyes have this problem where we, we have this narrow band that we can see between 417, uh, 790 terahertz. That's, that's, that's pretty uh, high frequencies there, but it's only one, uh, one doubling of the number, uh, which means that you know, even if I was to take this data and kind of shift it around, I could never squeeze it into this band that our eyes could see. We could never look directly at this image, uh, except for the artist's um, uh, impression there, this planet WASP. 17b. Uh, so I started to think, well, if we can't see them, can we hear them? The ear's got some advantages over the eye. The ear can hear up to uh, for between 20 and 20,000 hertz. So that's uh, the frequency of sound there. And that's 10, 10 doublings or 10 octaves, we call them. So actually I have my piano here. Uh, so if we, if we start with any given note, there we go. <laughs> um, from one note to another, that's a doubling in frequency. And I've got my whole piano here. I've got about eight octaves there, uh, so that human hearing is even wider than my piano. So there's some potential there. Um, because light and sound are both waves, uh, they have these properties of wavelength. Uh, and and frequency, which means that light frequencies can become musical notes, but we do have to slow them down a bit. Light frequencies are incredibly fast, much faster than um, than sound, so we have to shift them down. Uh, but um, we can fit a lot more in the space. So uh, we're back to where we started. Now, this is a spectrum. Uh, that it, I used to inspire the first piece, Water Romanza. And we can see that it has some interesting dips and troughs. And those are unique to water. We have found water on numerous exoplanets, and that's exciting because we know that water is crucial for life as we know it. And if I take the frequencies at these points, and I transform them into sound, I can get a musical chord. So perhaps you'll recognize. That sound from Water Romanza. My contention is that sound can allow us to hear relationships beyond the scope of our eyes. And I'll just play a bit more of that piece. It has an acoustic version as well. Um, I generally write at the piano and then work with the electronics to orchestrate. So Beth sang this at the beginning. Which is hopping around the spectrum there. So I, I uh, move around the peaks in an interesting order and that gave rise to melody. That last chord is an extended version of the water spectrum. It has a few more dissonant notes in there. Okay, so there was the concept for the album. There's, uh, I'm happy to go over some of those steps if anyone's really interested in the details. Um, certainly a lot of fun to translate one kind of information to another. But with that in place, I really realized that I had to do I had to do a lot more music because it works for all sorts of different. Uh, phenomena and, and it, you can look at the exoplanets themselves. 
So here is uh, another spectrum. And this isn't from an exoplanet. This is, uh, well, it's lawn grass. So something much more mundane. Uh, and you can see um, there's a bump in the green region here. So that's why it looks green to us. But look at this. There's this huge cliff shape uh, in the infrared. And uh, we can't see that, uh, but uh, insects can. And it's very, very bright reflectance that vegetation gives off, which is why I'm sure you've seen these images of what flowers look like to insects. You know, they have all kinds of patterns that our eyes don't pick up. Um, and, you know, if you look, um, you can see this reflectance uh, from space. It's, uh, it's so prominent. So here's, um, here's a planet, mystery planet, and you can see there's the, this is called the red edge because it's just beyond the infrared. And you can see there it is in this planet spectrum. Um, does anybody want to guess what planet this is or where it was found? Well, I hope you won't be disappointed. Lots of you got it right. It's, uh, it's a very familiar planet. It's Earth, uh, but Earth viewed uh, as if it were an exoplanet. So looking back at Earth uh, from, from space, uh, this is the Earthshine spectrum. Uh, so, you know, if we found an exoplanet that gave us this spectrum, we'd be very excited because there's a number of features that would make us think, okay, there, there might be vegetation here. Uh, there might be this big dip here shows us that oxygen is being absorbed um, at a specific um, wavelength there uh, by um, the diatoms of the sea, which produce most of us oxygen. So I was very excited about being able to see trees um, from space and we might be able to see trees on an exoplanet. So I want to share another music video with you. This is called Red Edge.
Hello again. Uh, so uh, the wonderful Beth Sterling and Amelia C performing there and that uh, fantastic alien vegetation created by the uh, the Boston uh, Planetarium, the Charles Hayden Planetarium. And uh, it's exciting that we might actually find this. Uh, you know, it is, it's uh, speculative, um, but it's, it's not out of reach. And we live in a, an amazing time uh, of, of science. So uh, I'm gonna. I don't have time. I realised I'm uh, already running behind. So I'm gonna uh, just take a selection of of things from this project to share, and, and so we have some time for questions. So I'll just I'll talk about this one, and you can listen to the music later if you like. Um, so this is a full exoplanet spectrum. So we, you know we've looked at specific features. This is an entire uh, planetary spectrum, and it's the one we we looked at a while back. It's called uh, WASP-17b, bit of a mouthful. Stands for Wide Angle Survey of Planets. Uh, System 17, second, the B, second planet from the sun. Uh, and it's a very nice one uh, to look at because we can attribute some of these dips to what is going on on the planets. So, oh, there we go. There's the chord. I'll play that in a sec. Uh, you, get the, you get how it works now. Uh, so that uh, that really big dip there is light that's being absorbed by sodium uh, in the atmosphere of the planet as it passes um, across the planet. And that uh, if I light into sound gives us a B flat, and then we get the potassium. You can see the presence there, and then three lines out of the water vapor spectrum. So we can split this spectrum apart and we learn uh, by comparing these dips to spectra that we can analyze in the lab, what's going on on the planet just from a single dot of light. And this one, uh, this one unfortunately is, is sort of a big gas giant. So uh, not so suitable for life as we know it, uh, but it's wonderful that we can, we can know so much about it. And it gives us all that, all those notes together. You can hear the water in there, uh, but it has this tension, which I really love. Uh, so that we, we did a piece, Wanderers, about um, the frustration of being earthbound uh, um, while knowing so much about our universe. Uh, with that, so you can, I'll play you that one. You can listen to that one if you like. Um, so uh, I've got one more piece of music for you and then we'll see how we're doing for time. Um, here is something more mundane. 
uh, it's it's ice. Uh, we had lots of ice in Boston, actually, uh, but just it all melted. Uh, my son was very sad. The snowman uh, is no more, but uh, he'll be back. As, as we told him. So <laughs> um, we'll make him again. But here, here's uh, the spectrum of ice, and it's different to water vapor. We can tell what state the water is in uh, by the, these patterns. And it's prevalent throughout our solar system, and we found it on exoplanets. Here it is in Saturn's rings. You can do a comparison. Uh, and it's present on this um, famous asteroid uh, that you perhaps know of. Uh, Ceres. Uh, it's a big size uh, asteroid in the asteroid belt. And we can look at it and see that it has ice on its surface. And also a mysterious white dot. The conspiracy theorists are having a lot of fun trying to tell what that is, because we haven't been, we haven't landed. Um, it could be an alien space station, or, or it could be salt. It's more likely to be salt. But well, but the, the, the cool thing is we're going to know. There are probes that will we'll visit Ceres and, and be able to tell us. And not only that, we'll be able to check that there is actually ice there. So it's a really good case that we can use this science of exoplanet spectroscopy um, and you know make a theory of what is there based on this light and then go and check. We can see if it's right. And that gives us confidence that when we make a, a measurement of an exoplanet light years away, uh, that we're right about what's actually there. So uh, here is the musical spectrum of ice, uh, and it's a lovely chord. I hope you'll agree. So I'm going to play something acoustic for you. Uh, just give me a second to uh, rewire myself here. Uh, this is a piece called Ceres. Here we go. Let's see a bit more of my music room here. Um, here is ice in our solar system and certainly beyond Ceres.
Okay. Thank you. I had a lot more. I will just wrap up then, and we've got. I'm sure I'd, I'd love to hear from you if you have questions. Uh, I'll just I'll skip through just sort of the conclusion here. There's there's a lot more to the project, and well, there's more I want to do. So uh, well, I wanted to show you uh, the final piece is all about life on other worlds, but you'll just have to hear that some other time. There we go. Uh, so what what are we doing next? Well, Octave of Light was originally written when I started it. Uh, we knew of no uh, viruses, so it's written to be played, performed live, the whole arc of the album. So uh, we really want to get out and play, um, you know, around the US and, well, hopefully in Virginia. So watch this space. And um, I've learned a lot about exoplanet science doing this project. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I'm, I'm very interested and... Um, you, you can be too. You know, none, none of the things I've shown are um, sort of secret knowledge. They're all out there. Uh, and, well, there are many levels beyond that. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Clara Souza Silva, uh, looks at a different signature that we can find on planets called, um, well, phosphine gas. There's Clara. And there's the molecule. And we uh, can associate that with anaerobic bacteria here uh, on Earth. Um, it's a good clue uh, to anaerobic bacteria sort of doing their thing. And some of you might know that uh, this may have been found on our planetary neighbor of Venus. So this, I mean, this came out right as we were finishing up this project, this news is so exciting. Um, so, you know, if, it's, if there are little microbes on Venus, they're probably everywhere. If we find a second instance of life, that probably means that it's, it's it's common. We live in a, a fertile universe. And of course, there's more music to be made, which keep me busy. Uh, so uh, the whole project is online. Uh, the music is online. Uh, to be, you can listen to it, download it, and you can, um, uh, if you want to support us and, and Multiverse and the kind of work we do, there are music videos for every piece that we're releasing. We're in the middle of releasing the music videos once every week on a Thursday night on our YouTube. So you can check that out. Uh, Multiverse does all kinds of projects, multiverseseries.org. We've got one on the 29th of January all about polymers, totally different project uh, with um, musical robotics, that one. And I've got a lot of people to thank for, for this project. Um, Beth Sterling, Soprano, Amelia C. Violin, Roy Gould, Science, the visuals created by the staff of the Charles Hayden Planetarium at the Boston Museum of Science, Chuck Wilcox, Wade Sylvester, Heather Fairweather, Jason Fletcher. Uh, we kickstarted the project originally. Thank you to everyone who made this a reality. And of course, Jim Blow and the Science Museum of Virginia for hosting me. Uh, and with that, I think we've got a little bit of time for questions. All right, so we did have a question about uh, in the first video for the Water Romanza, what is that small keyboard instrument that you're playing? Uh, oh, it's not a keyboard. Do you know? Uh, hold on. So um, when we play live, we have lots and lots of loudspeakers and instruments and microphones. And uh, this is a mixing board, but it's a, it's a small one. And uh, I can put it on my lap and... Uh, you could play it like an instrument. So controlling how loud things are. Um, if we have lots of loud speakers, we can move the sound around the room so it can be in front of you or behind you. Um, it, it's a lot of fun. And I, you know, I love to perform electronic music as much as I do the piano. Uh, they, they go hand in hand for me. You got any more questions? Uh, it looks like we do have with us uh, Mr. Chuck Wilcox, the animator from Yes. Boston, if anyone has any questions on the visuals. Well, Chuck, yeah, do you know, I have a question for Chuck. Uh, so I know um, everybody involved, but I don't know which which ones were who, or did you all work together on each one, each each piece? Um, so I worked on the Red Edge. Uh, oh, great. Yeah. So that, that's your alien world. 
Mm -hmm. We created it. We create uh, most of our visual content in 3D packages. This was a one, a one called View. Uh, it's been used in feature films. And so it comes pre pre made with a uh, series of alien uh, ah. trees and plants that you can put on. And, and so I had a lot of fun doing that. And we also use Maya. Uh, Autodesk Maya for a lot of our 3D content. And then we did a lot of 2D editing for a lot of our works, like the water work. We use various uh, footage clips or we can generate uh, particle effects and apply filters to them. So we work in After Effects, which is another common video editing tool. Well, I'm so grateful yeah. for everything that you all did. Well, we should You're talk welcome. More. It was a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. <laughs> we should talk uh, more. So we did have a couple other questions here in the chat. Uh, how would you describe the value of art and music for society? <laughs> um, highly. <laughs> well, um, I mean, it's that's a big question, isn't it? Uh, I think that um, perhaps this is evidence of the value of art and music because here we all are. Uh, trapped in our own homes, trying to stay safe, uh, and yet we, we've been brought together through, uh, well, through science and music, both different ways of uh, discovering our world. You know, I, I think if I I try to think about, you know, how music and science are, well, obviously they're different. They have different goals, uh, but what do they have in common? Uh, and this word of discovery keeps coming up for me. So science is discovering uh, our world, the nature of the world we live in, and, and music. It's helping, or well, art and music help us make sense of that um, and discover really ourselves and how we connect with all that. You know, how do we feel about uh, being a human, being in this um, existence? So I'd like to talk more about that. We can come up with a definitive answer. Uh, so uh, how many songs do you anticipate doing total? Do you see an end stage or? So Op Octave of Light uh, is, uh, that album is, is finished and it's out. You can hear, get it on Spotify, um, that's seven songs. Um, and I, you know, it has an arc to it. Uh, so it, you let you hear about these sort of different things you can find within the light of an exoplanet. And then the, there's a climactic track called Equals Life, which uh, sort of puts them together and tries to come up with recipes for what uh, alien life uh, might look like uh, with, a, with a telescope. Um, but that doesn't mean the project is done. And I'm learning much more in Clara, I, I spoke about with phosphine. I uh, have sonified phosphine. So uh, there's a piece in the works for that. Um, so I'm going to be very busy. I don't know if I'll call it Octave of Light 2. Maybe there's something more catchy. But um, as much as I can, uh, what I can do with the time I have. All right, so uh, if the spectrums of light give you the notes to use, how do you go about determining the dynamics of the piece and composing that? Uh, not as rigorously, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there comes a point. So I start with, this, with the sonification, and I want to be very... Well, I want to come up with a reproducible method so that somebody else can do the same thing as me. They can look at the same, well, you know, maybe the same data set or a different one and get, you know, hopefully the same musical result um, so that it works when I come across new data that I want to sonify or other people could could use it. Um, uh, but beyond that, you know, I, so the sonification is there. In this case, it, you know, I end up with a chord, musical chord, but for other projects, I might get a melody, could be something, could be a rhythm. Um, but then beyond that, I start to think about what it means to me. So there's more than just the um, the molecules. So that water romanza has this, I don't know if you picked up a kind of a yearning uh, tone to that one. Uh, it's sort of thinking about water, because we know there's water on um, inanimate worlds, the worlds that you can get water, but no life. So water clearly isn't enough. Uh, for life to spring out. You need other things. So there's water that's out there that's sort of yearning for life. And also, we're, you know, we're yearning. We don't want to be alone. We, we, want, we want to know um, that there's more beings out there. Uh, so that is sort of woven together. And each of the pieces, you know, I'm bringing in 
different perspectives on the science as well as the um, sort of the, the molecule or the, the uh, phenomenon and combine them together. I mean, I get to make my own choices for a while. And then I don't know if, if I'm sure many of you are artists and musicians as well. And you've all come across that point where it starts to write itself, whatever you're working on. You know, you do a lot of work at the beginning to set it up. But if you've done that right, it, it, it writes itself and you just follow the thread and you end up with something that uh, surprises you. Uh, at least it always surprises me. It's a shock sometimes. <laughs> All right, so uh, we did have a question here. Uh, which alien world or exoplanet is your favorite? Well, I would say WASP-17b, just because it's the one I've had the most fun with. Uh, that It's got this lovely uh, sort of combination of, of the spectrums, and I got this jazzy chord out of it. Uh, so I sort of built a whole piece around that one, or even though it's a sort of a gas giant, sort of like a Jupiter planet. So, um, I mean, there are, there are sort of... Um, Tales of planets with the rain glass and, you know, planets with uh, sort of multiple suns. I mean, these are all out there. So, um, you know, and they, they follow the news, you know, um, uh, Reddit space is a good channel. I mean, there are lots of communities of, of people out there just um, analyzing the data from, from telescopes and there's an exoplanet news just every few days about things that we've discovered. And now is the time to learn um, what's out there. And there are going to be some amazing things in the next months and years, for sure. All right. I don't see anything else in the chat. So we'll go ahead and bring it to a close. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Rivet, for helping us discover more about our world. Uh, so please join us next week, Wednesday, January 6th at noon. We are going to have with us Colonel Buzz Carpenter, United States Air Force retired, and he's going to be presenting Fighting the Cold War at 85,000 feet. If you've been to the Science Museum, you know that we have uh, in our speed gallery, we have our SR-71 Blackbird uh, displayed, suspended from the ceiling, the only one in the world dis that's uh, displayed this way. Uh, and Colonel Carpenter was actually uh, an SR-71 pilot, and he'll be talking about what it was like to fly that iconic aircraft during the Cold War. Uh, so you can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend. It's open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Thank you all for being here.